Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining our virtual event. Uh, it's Startup Week, it's sponsored by Techstars. And today we have a very distinguished panel, Ken Lehrman, Amy Meyerson, and Carlton Chen. I'm the sort of low person on the totem pole here doing the moderating, so I just sort of want to I'll kick it off with a, with a few descri uh, descriptions about Ken. Attorney Ken Lehrman practice focus areas are business securities, corporate contracts, and commercial real estate with law offices in Hartford, Connecticut, and Boca Raton. Ken is the current vice chair of business law section of Connecticut Bar Association and is heavily involved in the business community in the bar. He received a professional excellence award from the Connecticut Law Tribune and ALM in 2019. Ken, thanks for joining us this afternoon. Amy Myerson is the president of the Connecticut Bar Association. She was elected, I believe, this summer, July. Amy, is that correct? July 1st. All right, excellent. She practices uh, business and general corporate law. She shared her JD from the University of Connecticut School of Law and received her AB with distinction from Duke University. Amy is admitted in Connecticut, Georgia, in the District of Columbia. Welcome, Amy. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Carlton, Carlton Chen is a seasoned law firm business lawyer, entrepreneur, executive, angel investor and co-founder of successful startups, a former vice president general counsel at well-known companies. He's a 2015 Connecticut Law Tribune recipient of a Lifetime Achievement Award, as well as other uh, Legal Best Practices Award. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we're going to be talking about a legal perspective, the care and feeding of startups during COVID-19, and we're going to come at it from a number of different angles. Uh, I, I think it's going to be a very good conversation. Uh, I'm hoping that folks that have joined us from the Connecticut Bar Association are active and busy on the chat. If you if you type a question in the chat, we have folks working for Techstars who will convert those chats over to our platform, and we'll be able to plug those into the demonstration uh, presentation. Excuse me. All right, Ken, you're ready to go. I'm ready to go. All right, take it away. All Thank right, you. I'm going to share my slides, and if anyone would like them. Uh, I'll make them available and we can get them distributed through, um, through Techstars. Um, I apologize. Let me just figure out which one they are on the screen. They all, everything looks funny. Here they are. And pardon my knuckles. That's uh, my mouse doesn't seem to work with Zoom. Here we go. So, uh, we're going to talk today about uh, entity selection, or I'm, my pro portion of the talk is about entity selection and equity incentives. Uh, so in terms of entity selection, there's all kinds of entities. There's corporations, limited liability companies, non-stock corporations, social benefit corporations, social benefit LLCs, statutory trusts, and a number of other uh, type of entities. Those are the key, key ones. And my screen, well, um, my top line, I guess I didn't uh, realize how this would appear on Zoom. So the top line says public companies and private companies. So the, the in terms of entity selection, you want to think about whether your venture is going to end up becoming a public company or it'll stay private. Uh, it, it depends on lots of things. Carlton's gonna to touch on some of that as well. But uh, in terms of public companies, they'd be subject to the United States Securities and Exchange Commission and their regulations. 90% are typically incorporated in Delaware. Uh, all companies are subject to state corporate laws. Uh, private companies, most are usually incorporated in their state of operations. So for instance, if you're operating in Connecticut, you typically just form a Connecticut corporation or a Connecticut LLC, um, and they're subject to the state corporate laws as well, the, the laws that, uh, of in, the state of incorporation. So this is a nice big slide, Connecticut versus Delaware. Uh, that's something we should talk about, but with the limited time, really getting into it in detail would, be, would just take up the entire program. But basically, if you have a private company and you're located in Connecticut, forming something in Delaware at this point would not make sense. It typically makes more sense once you're dealing with venture capital uh, entities who are going to invest. 
um, or you're getting close to an IPO. And if that's the case, you can always re-domesticate, but there's also arguments why you could stay in Connecticut. But we, that's, that's, like I said, that's a long conversation. Entity selection, number one, pick one. Make sure you are operating as an entity. You're not just a couple of guys with uh, some really neat uh, computer software and you're working out of your garage. Once you're dealing with people, once you, you have investors, once you are starting to purchase uh, services and offer services, you need to be an entity. It creates a safety net for liability. Um, there's, you can pick one based on the structure that you're planning, but the real key is you want to be formed as an entity. Um, the, um, you know, the, it, it, well, that, all right, that's touching on what I just said. So corporations. So you'll see at the end of the name, Inc. or Incorporated or Corp. or sometimes LTD, Limited. Um, it's, I'm sorry, I have to um, shrink down the box because it was blocking my, my view of my slides. Um, it's so corporations are structured by statutes and that creates the operating framework. Uh, you have to be very careful that you adhere to the requirements of the statutes. Typically, most of the key corporate statutes are embodied in your bylaws to be a, a way to walk through uh, procedures that you need to follow. It's, it's managed by the board of directors they delegate certain authorities to the officers and it's owned by the shareholders. You have to have uh, board meetings and you have to have at least one shareholder meeting a year. Um, you can have shareholder agreements that are designed to firm up things between the owners and that gets, uh, that can get critical, it can get involved. Um, limited liability companies, they're, you see at the name, the end of the name, LLC. So when we talk about LLCs, that's what we're talking about. It's, it can be managed by managers or members. Uh, the members are the owners. It, I find it's better to have the management specified managers. So that way you're specifying who's in charge, especially if you, as you start to add other members. LLCs are operating, are uh, contract-based. The operating agreement becomes their essential Bible they, it gets involved drafting a uh, LLC agreement because the statutes have some defaults, but for the most part, uh, everyone likes to vary the agreements and there's lots of good reasons to do that, to create different settings and different uh, rights between the parties. Um, many people set up LLCs without an attorney and without an accountant. Um, that is often a walk into the abyss of the law, as I like to say, because as things get involved, you start realizing your operating agreement is deficient and it becomes a real problem. And it becomes a bigger problem as you add investors. It's a real big problem with investors. So um, getting professional help is very important. Uh, typically you'll see, you know, the guy that's running the, the corner shop around the, They'll, they might form an LLC, they might do it themselves, and it's, you know, it's a husband and wife team or uh, a couple of people that typically can get away with it. Uh, they'll typically not get into much trouble not having had a professionally drafted operating agreement. So um, Ken, non stock Ken, corporate. Hey, Ken, we had, a quick, we had a question from the audience sure. here, if I, if I could toss it at you, okay. Um, no problem. There was a, the question was, uh, would you recommend incorporation in Delaware or better in your local area? Okay, so again, that's that's a real involved discussion. But so the big advantages of Delaware are they have a, a court of chancery. That's a, a business court. Connecticut has a complex litigation docket, although it really hasn't operated as uh, in the same manner as the Court of Chancery, and it sh although it should, um, there's very, there's really not significant um, advantages unless you're going to be a public company to be in Delaware, um, and even then, there's good arguments to be a public company in Connecticut. But most of the public companies I've represented have been incorporated in Delaware. Some in Nevada, a couple in Maine. Uh, 
Um, but generally, if at the outset, you're just adding costs and complications to your, your structure. Um, by, by the way, in terms of questions, my wife looked at these slides and she said, wow, they're boring. And I said, that's, that's intentional. So that way people don't ask questions because you guys <laughs> fall asleep. So, uh, so non-stock corporations, that, that's really, that's an entity, but that's not something that typically uh, the Techstar crowd is going to be terribly interested in. Social benefit corporations, uh, again, that, that might have some interest because so it's basically a corporation, but in addition, you add this, um, this social benefit cause to the charter and that there's an obligation to follow through on that. And you actually have to start reporting to the state attorney general. I, I actually campaigned against their, the, the uh, enactment of that act because I think you can add that to a general corporation, not be subject to the attorney general and you know, and, and not have that extra level of, of regulation. Again, another talk, um, another day, but it, it's out there, it, it can be used, it can, it could actually be a public entity if desired, but uh, it, it, I haven't seen that, um, that kind of push at this point. Um, so a list of other types of entities, uh, equity incentive compensation. Uh, before we get into that, are there other questions that have been chatted in about entity selection. Nothing here yet, Ken. Okay, and we can always jump back. Yeah. Uh, so equity incentives. Typically, when you think of an equity incentive, you're thinking stock options. That's what you usually hear. Um, people use funny terms with them. Uh, some of the some of the official terms are sound kind of funny, but uh, but people think of themselves as a partner. Well, you're really nothing until you exercise that option. Um, you can also get equity incentives as in stock and all that. So um, equity incentives are ownership interests or a way to share in the growth. It's an incentive or a reward for current employees, officers, directors, and key, and key consultants. Um, sign on bonuses. Oh, the most important thing about incentives. Oh, oh, oh. I forgot to paste it in. Uh, I don't have, I'm joking. I, I put this slide in just to wake you guys up. Um, we're gonna get to everything that covers this. So the benefit of equity incentives are, you can retain valuable employees by using them. You can attract new key personnel by using them. It saves on cash flow. You, it's, a, it's another way of, value, of uh, compensation. It aligns the interests of employees with the interests of the company. So. You know, if the company fails, their equity incentives fail. So there's there's that alignment of interest that that can help drive a lot of loyalty and a lot of uh, a lot of real extra effort by people. Um, there can be tax advantages for the company and the employee. Uh, it, it can be structured so there's long-term capital gains. So the income can be taxed at a much lower rate. That's that's always fun, and you can defer income. Uh, with certain options and and certain approaches, so the key about equity incentives. It's hey, Ken, Ken, we have a question. If you'd like me to fire sure, through, sure. sure. Uh, the question was, where does a B corp fit? That's a benefit corporation. Just it's just the letter is just where does the B letter B corp fit? So I'm assuming it, I'm it's assuming. a benefit corporation. So that's the social benefit corporation that I talked about a couple minutes okay. ago. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Um, so there, typically when you're talking corporations, you're talking C Corp and S Corp. And a C Corp uh, is, is the broadest form. It, it's an it's a IRS designation. Um, so that would be the corporation is taxed as itself. It's not a pass-through. If it's an S Corp, it's taxed. Um, the, the tax is passed through to the owners and it also has certain restrictions. You can only have one type, one class of securities. You can't, so you can only have common stock or you can only have preferred stock. Uh, you cannot have entities as a shareholder and foreign investment in them is, is tougher. There's all kinds of issues um, between those two. Um, back to equity incentives. So compensation, 
the key thing to remember is it is compensation. It's, it's an option, but it's compensation. So it's like cash, treat it like cash, think of it like cash, but it's on a cash-free basis, right? You don't have to, the company doesn't have to uh, give someone a hundred thousand dollar bonus. They can give them 10,000 shares, 1,000 shares, whatever the number is. It seems like a cheap giveaway in the beginning, but remember it's secret gold because when the v VCs come calling, you're going to want to have as the, as the founder, you're going to want to have as much ownership and control as possible. And the more you give away in the early part, when the company's not that valuable, uh, the less control and ownership you're going to have down the road and the more dilution you're going to suffer as more and more investors come in. Um, let's see. So it, again, it, it ties into future growth and potential mega returns. I mean, that's the appeal, right? You, you get some shares and you think when this company's worth a hundred million dollars, you're going to have X percent and it's going to be worth $5 million or some great number. Um, what we is an equity? We, we have another question. Wait, wait. So these boring slides are not working. <laughs> I think the slides, are, I think it's getting people to, per, you know, getting the brain percolating. So here's right. the question is. I'll that, have pictures next time. I promise. <laughs> you mentioned incentives with equity. Would warrants also serve as an incentive? They can. So, uh, yeah, a, a warrant is definitely uh, an incentive. Um, Warrants are typically options. Well, they are options. They're usually uh, issued on a, it's usually issued as not as an, as an equity incentive. It's usually used as um, an incentive for investment. It's usually attached to some, so you might have someone buy some common stock or preferred stock, and then they get a warrant to exercise that is exercisable into common stock as kind of an equity kicker, that's what they call that. So it's an incentive, but it's really an incentive for investors. You certainly could define a warrant under a stock option plan for, for um, employees. I've never done it that way, but you know, for the most part, a rose is a rose and a warrant and an option are effectively the same thing. Um, so, you know, just a list of option of, equity incentives, stock options, and these are things you, you've probably heard of. And so I just want to give you a list. So stock options, bonuses, restricted stock, restricted stock units, phantom equity or phantom stock, uh, profit interests, hybrids, others. Well, hybrids are, you're, you're mixing some of these concepts together. Um, others is there because there's always something new coming out. So with stock options, the, the key aspect is there's non-qualified stock options and qualified stock options. They qualify under the uh, Internal Revenue Code. It's Section 422. Uh, there's, there's all kinds of restrictions and, and obligations under qualified. So the first one, the first couple are, and that's with respect to both programs, would be a written plan with shareholder approval and you'd have an option agreement with the option E and the company. So they'd be agreeing what the terms of the option are, how many options you're getting, what the exercise price is, when you can exercise, when they vest. The vesting is when uh, the options become good, when you're allowed to start exercising and purchasing. So, so um, I think if, if we need to go into that more, I'm happy to. Uh, Non-qualified stock options, uh, so the employee tax impact, uh, they're taxable at, as ordinary income on the date of exercise. Um, tax is paid on the difference between fair market of the shares and the, and the stri strike price. Uh, there are some new exceptions under the Jobs Act. Um, it gets complicated. That's actually not been used much. It, it, the restrictions are so difficult that um, most entrepreneurs don't want to apply them. I mean, for instance, the biggest one is the, um, I forget the exact amount, but the uh, entrepreneur, I think it's anyone over 10% ownership can't get the options. And owners like to also participate in these option plans. So I, all the companies I represent, uh, no one wants to use that restriction. Um, so then future appreciation after exercise is generally a capital gain. So there's your tax uh, your your um, tax benefit. 
Uh, the employer tax impact, it's deductible as regular comp. Um, qualified plans, so you hear of them also called ISOs, incentive stock options. So that's when you hear ISO, that's technically and typically being uh, the qualified. So favorable tax, treat, tax treatment applies if after exercise, the employee doesn't dispose of the shares within two years or one year of exercise. So there's a holding period. The idea is again, incentive. That means incentive to stay and work in the enterprise. Uh, employees uh, and, the, and the employees remained uh, as an employee for um, until three months prior. Qualified. Um, so can we, can we get another question here? Okay. All right. Uh, when a startup is in the process of bringing on co-founders, do you recommend particular documents to be drafted and agreed to before the professional relationship is official? For instance, yes, in NDAs, non-competes, and others aside from equity vesting schedules. Okay, so um, yes, I, the answer to that is yes, but it's not just those. So NDAs, that's a non-disclosure agreement. Uh, that should be signed by anyone who's going to learn anything about the secret sauce. If you're talking to people without the secret sauce, you're making without an agreement and you're talking about the secret sauce, you're making a big, big mistake. Non-competes, that works in a lot of states. It's, um, it's been outlawed in California. They're not enforceable. Um, and I, I'm starting to come around to they're less and less important. Uh, as long as you have a strong NDA and people can't use the information, but restricting them from where they work, uh, I, I'm, I'm less and less uh, interested in that. Uh, but also other agreements that you want, you, you would want a shareholder agreement. You know, so you don't, you, so that way everyone understands what their role is, what their rights are to the stock. If there's clawback rights, clawback is what it sounds like. You can take it back. Uh, you can take it back sometimes for free. Sometimes you have to pay them some money. Uh, I typically have them pay money. I think that's more fair. And I also think it falls under general contract law of, of uh, granting consideration. Um, so again, there's favorable tax treatment of ISOs. That gets real involved, um, but it... it um, ISOs are, have a good place in a company that's going to go public um, as as a means of um, of uh, incentivizing a company that might not go public. It may not be worth putting the extra obligations on, and you just do a non qualified plan. The restrictions are less. It's easier to draft. Um, you know, you, you don't have to get in it to as much, and it costs less in terms of legal legal assistance. Um, stock bonuses and restricted stock. So usually there's a written plan. Um, it creates ownership rights upon the issuance. Uh, stock bonus is a grant of a stock as an award. So it's also immediate ownership, but it's an award. You have, you own the stock. So that means you have voting rights. You have other rights um, like the right to dig into the books and records of the company. You have the right to go to shareholder meetings. Um, typically with a stock bonus though, you'll have restricted sale rights or transfer rights. So you can't just freely transfer it because the corporation wants to make sure that they know who owns it and they're dealing with the people they want to deal with. And you're not selling it to someone down the line and uh, you know, once they're public, that's a different story. Then you can sell it into the public market. Restricted stock units. Um, this is stock, but it's not issued until the rights vest. It usually includes a forfeiture right, um, and you can claw back if you depart. The company can claw back if you depart. It's taxable upon, upon vesting. Again, it has to be, that is a, a specific term, and it has to be set up with an appropriate um, plan and program. Phantom stock rights, um, these are fun. Uh, phantom stock rights, the stock never issues. So the employee never gets a share of stock. They never get the stock certificate to hang on their, on their wall or to show off. Uh, not, that, not that people really do that. I mean, they, they have like when the Boston Celtics went public, people bought stock, got stock certificates and actually framed them. 
Um, but uh, phantom stock rights, it's basically an as if. If you got, um, if you got a phantom stock right, you would, um, and then the company sells, the, there's an IPO event or the company is bought out. They would put into, well, it's easier with a sale. That's just easier to understand. So easier to explain. So the company takes the, the, all, it, all its shareholders, it coordinates all its shareholders and says, we're selling the stock to uh, so-and-so hedge fund. And the people with phantom rights say, but I don't have any stock to deliver. Right. All they have to do is sign that they are, they agree that their phantom rights are being assigned and the company, the, the hedge fund would pay them the value, the same value as if they had had those shares. So the nice thing for the company or the founder is you don't have to um, give out ownership it, similar and you don't, and no one ever votes and you own a hundred percent, you can control the whole thing. It's, it's, it's kind of a nice program. Uh, profits, interests, those are similar. They're typically done with LLCs. Uh, it's a contract right to share in the profits. Um, many LLCs, most of them, when you do the operating agreement, you specify who has a profit interest. You know, it's typically all of the members, but you can, structure an LLC with uh, economic interests versus ownership interests. So you're separating who gets money when it closes and who gets to vote and who gets to control management separate from the economics. Um, that's, that's the way that is structured. Um, ownership, I probably should have said this in the beginning. So ownership is obviously exactly what you think it means. It's voting rights, ownership and the equity of the enterprise rights to books and records, and other rights by state statute. Um, Section 409A, um, that, that has to do with the deferred compensation. Um, and you know, if um, it's triggered if uh, there's operating, you know, under the operational rules of 409A for timing of deferrals and distributions, if, and the uh, deferred compensation. So that would apply to equity incentives and, and it, it, the trigger is equity incentives and severance and change in control payments and bonuses and things like that. Uh, that's under the, the Internal Revenue Code. So that's me and that's me. Great, thank you very much, Ken. Appreciate My pleasure. That. Appreciate that. So Ken, can you stop sharing? I realize that I need to do that. Thank you. Hi, folks. All right, Carlton, you ready to go? Uh, Amy's going to be my assistant. She's going to be advancing the slides for me. So, Amy, are you going to get that on the screen first? Yeah. All set, Carlton. Okay, I don't see it. <laughs> That's okay, as long as you guys can see it. Okay, so uh, are we on slide one? Yeah. We're good. Okay, thanks, Chris. Hi, everybody. Uh, my topic for discussion is what angels look for. Uh, I've been an angel as well as a business development consultant to startups. And I also was a founding member of the New York chapter of Gritsu Forum Mid-Atlantic for several years. Uh, this is an angel group uh, that has over 50 chapters on four continents. It's one of the largest angel groups in the world. And in my uh, chapter uh, meeting in Manhattan, at, at each meeting, there are about 25 individual angels and an equal number of guests in attendance. At least that's when we were meeting face to face. Uh, and the startups I invested in have been limited to healthcare, medtech, and life science companies. Uh, while an angel, I've probably heard about and critiqued uh, over 400 pitches. So from this perspective, I'll, I'll be sharing some of what I've learned with you. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the key takeaways from my presentation would be, uh, why are some startups more successful than others? How do startups get traction to grow their business? And how do startup CEOs and founders attract funding? Um, 
before I go to the next slide, um, I, I just wanted to make reference to uh, uh, Ken's, Ken's presentation. He was saying uh, LLC versus corporation. Angels actually prefer corporations so that it spears us of having to receive or beg for the form K-1s at the end of each year. And uh, the other thing is that um, we prefer for the entity to be organized in Delaware uh, rather than another state, um, regardless of whether uh, it's an LLC or a corporation. Uh, we also prefer corporations because uh, we, we look for uh, negotiating to receive preferred shares it grants us uh, priority rights over uh, over the founders. Uh, in any event, I'll get to that uh, a little bit later. Okay, next slide. Um, okay, first I'd like to set the table with what's an angel and what are his or her activities and goals. Um, an angel is an individual investor who uses his or her own funds to provide capital for an early stage startup. Um, the angel is most always an accredited investor. And uh, by the way, accredited investors aren't limited to just being individuals. Uh, they can be institutions and legal entities. And I'll talk about individuals who qualify as accredited investors on the next slide. Anyway, in exchange for making a financial investment, the angel receives an ownership stake in the startup. And usually the investment is made after uh, founders, friends, and family provide the startup capital in what's called a, a pre-seed round. Uh, this is when the startup is getting set up. It's a stage that is beyond a, uh, a dream and a prayer. Oh, I can see the, uh, I can see my, uh, my, uh, my, my slides now. Uh, so um, this is a point when the startup has a, a MVP uh, that is a minimally viable product and has launched. Um, as the startup grows, its product or service begins to gain traction. Uh, the product development is ongoing. Sales begin to come in. The startup builds a management and technical team, uh, generates IP rights, and now it reaches the next level of growth. And that's when the startup is ready to accelerate. And that's when angels enter the picture in a seed round or a subsequent A round. Uh, this is when the startup's valuation is usually less than $10 million. And uh, the individual angel's investment in this round is typically anywhere from $25,000 to $100,000, maybe more. But it can be as low as five to $10,000 when invested uh, through a special purpose vehicle that generally the angel group will set up in order to allow for these smaller amounts to be invested. And I, I should point out that at this stage, it's usually too early to attract venture capitalists. So what is an angel group? An angel group is an organized body of angels who work together to do angel investing. Um, please be mindful that the angel group is a facilitator. It's not a registered investment advisor. It's not a broker dealer. Um, let me say it's also very common for an angel to join an angel group rather than to invest alone. Uh, the benefits of membership in a angel group um, are access to the best deal flow, um, opportunities to mind share, uh, meaning identifying the attraction and sharing the critiques about the startup as an investment opportunity. You know, we're in a room together and we ask really smart questions. It's great. It's a great time not to be the smartest person in the room. Um, there are obviously there are uh, uh, some angels who have industry experience who are more equipped to determine the opportunity for investment with a particular company that's in their sphere of of expertise. Um, another uh, reason for uh, joining an angel group is uh, collaboration on performing due diligence. And probably the most important thing about being a member of an angel group is that uh, the angel group head negotiates the valuation and the terms and conditions of the term sheet. That's really key to the investment. Um, the decision to invest is up to the 
the vigil angel. Uh, I, I think that there are some angel groups that require minimums for their angels every year to invest. Um, the angel group that I belong to did not have any minimum. It had a membership fee that you had to pay every year, but your decision to make an investment is on your own. And an angel's strategy is to make 10 to 25 investments in startups for portfolio diversification. So let's say if you're investing in 20 you know, startups and $25,000 a shot, that's about a half a million dollars. And if there's only one or two startups in the portfolio that successfully exits with a multiple of 12 times the original investment, then the ROI from the portfolio can be fairly decent. Uh, but please be aware that uh, these are really long-term and high-risk investments. Uh, interestingly, I, I met one of uh, the partners of a law firm that I worked for uh, quite a number ago, uh, years ago, and um, um, I asked him because he, as when I was a young associate at his firm, he was having me handle a lot of the startups that he had actually invested in. And I asked him if, um, you know, how he did with those investments years later. And I think there were like uh, nine or 10 that, uh, uh, nine or 10 startups I was working on. And he, he looked at me and he shook his head and he said, you know, all of them failed me. And then he smiled and said, except one. And that made all the difference in the world. And uh, that just goes to show you that there is risk, but there's reward. Next slide, please. Okay, what's an accredited investor? Uh, it's a high net worth individual that the SEC permits to invest in certain companies uh, that may raise capital via private placement without that company needing to register securities with the SEC. And this is something that Ken had covered in his slides. Um, for individual, there's a net worth or income test that must, must be satisfied. And under the net worth test, uh, one's net worth must exceed a million dollars, either individually or jointly with the spouse, excluding the value of the primary residence. And under the income test, one's annual income must exceed 200,000 or $300,000 for joint income for the last two years with the expectation that the income will be the same or higher in the current year. And these threshold amounts have not been increased for many years. Um, and the, the net worth and income tests have been widely criticized for they're not having much relevance to the sophistication of the investor. So the SEC entertained rulemaking and finally agreed to adopt the third test, the financial sophistication test that will take effect later this year. Um, the, uh, the SEC will expand the definition of accredited investor to include those individuals whose demonstrated financial knowledge uh, will have series 765 or 82 licenses as investment um, advisors. But this uh, new test still falls short of the mark um, and I just want to show uh, by illustration the ridiculousness of um, this new test. Um, for instance, if a Yale School of Management professor who teaches finance um, wants to become an accredited investor but doesn't meet the net worth test or the income test, and he's not um, licensed in any of these accreditations, he's still not eligible to be an accredited investor. Um, Next slide, please. Hey, Ken, we have a question here. Okay. Okay. Uh, the question is, uh, with, the, with any preference um, uh, in the, in, I'm trying to decipher what the question means. Any preference in the industry when it comes to single versus multiple founders involved? We, we, we definitely prefer multiple founders. We don't like uh, startups who go it alone. Um, we want a well-rounded management team uh, with uh, this not being their first rodeo. Actually, we like investors, we like founders who have failed in their other startups because they learn a lot from um, failure. Great, thank you. 
Okay, so what's the role of an angel investing? What's the role of angel investing in a uh, in a startup uh, ecosystem? Well, for many years, angels have served as a powerful engine for driving uh, successful new ventures, and their contributions will continue. Uh, put it this way: if it weren't for angels, companies like Airbnb, Instagram, Pinterest, LinkedIn, Uber, Snapchat. Uh, Twitter and Facebook, uh, they might never have existed. So any economic recovery after the pandemic will continue to rely on the creation of new businesses to drive job growth and momentum. And critical to the success of the startup ecosystem are angels. So to put this in perspective, let me share some data from the 2019 Angel Fund Funders Report prepared for the Angel Capital Association. Uh, in the US and Canada, 68 angel groups made $22.8 million in investments in 905 startups. And when taking into account syndications with other angel groups, individual angels, VC firms, and other private equity investors, the total investments received by these 905 companies was 1.8 billion for an average invested of about $2 million per company. Uh, next slide, please. So what are the dynamics of pitching for angel dollars? Uh, be before the coronavirus pandemic, angel groups organized person-to-person -person pitch sessions that uh, have been hugely important to raising funds. Now pitching is um, in the virtual world and it's necessary uh, that um, angels and startups make the best of it. Uh, the biggest disadvantage to virtual pitching is the inability to read the room for cues and creating personal chemistry with the, the audience as is what we're doing right now. We're not looking at any reaction from the crowd, right? Uh, including the immediacy of any one-on-one -on -one pre meetings and follow-up. But the biggest advantage is saving on time, money, effort to travel. I mean, we're all, or at least I think Amy and I are in the, com and, and, and Chris are in the comfort of our own homes. <laughs> um, and uh, also the virtual event uh, potentially attracts a larger group of people who are in this case, prospective investors. Plus uh, we have the ability to capture chat comments and Q and A's without disrupting the flow of the presentation. And finally, there's that ability to record the session if we want. In addition, a customized event platform uh, can uh, certainly enable follow-on um, uh, deep dive breakout sessions. And all of that can even be conducted virtually with each presenting company, as well as the ability to schedule one-on-one -on -one meetings throughout and after the timeline of the event. So from where I sit, I believe that angel investing has overcome the challenges that the pandemic has presented, but the proof will be in next year's angel funders report. Next slide, please. Okay, here's a graph that shows angel investments made in the US and Canada in 2018 by round, the pre-seed round, the seed round, series A and B rounds and beyond. And to provide a recap on the different rounds, the pre-seed round is funded by the founders without external investors. Um, it, it can include borrowing from or investing by friends, family, uh, founders, and sometimes they call them fools <laughs> uh, at the very uh, early stage of a startup. And the second stage is the seed round to stimulate a startup substantial growth. And this is when a startup has a team, product and sales channels. And this is when funds are needed to scale the business. So the series A round and beyond are used to raise funds for rapid growth. And this funding gives a startup the capital it needs to develop the products, uh, round out its management, operations and technical team and implement its go-to-market strategy. So as you can see from this chart, 85% of the total deals, that's 60% um, uh, plus 
And 86% of the total dollars, which is 65% and 21%, were invested by angels in the seed uh, and series A rounds combined with an average of about $100,000 raised during either round. Now, this reported average valuation in the seed round uh, was 6.4 million and the median was 5 million. Uh, but these figures are for angel activity in the US and Canada. And, and um, let me just say this, these, these numbers are quite anemic compared to my own personal angel investing experience in New York. Uh, from where I sit, the average investment in the aggregate made by angels in an angel group at Kritzu Forum begins at $500,000 and are made primarily in the A round. But again, it depends on the local affluence, the local customs, and how much has been previously raised, uh, plus the startup's valuation. Uh, next slide, please. So from my perspective in the mid-Atlantic area, New York style, uh, as a member of my Manhattan-based angel group, perhaps two thirds of the startups that we see are med tech and life sciences companies. And, at these companies, the funds raised are mostly used for high cost medical research. And uh, we as angels don't expect to see any revenue from these startups uh, after we invest, but we do hope to see our payday when they're acquired by uh, someone from Big Pharma. <clears throat> as angels, uh, we like to see these med tech and life sciences uh, companies awarded with uh, non-diluted funding in the form of grants from the uh, NIH, government agencies, private foundations. And in the case of these types of startups, it's not uncommon that they seek more than $2 million uh, at, at, for, for a round, sometimes even in the seed round. And, and as an example, I was on a due diligence team and uh, eventually invested in a life sciences company, a, a pharmaceutical company startup that sought and raised $6 million from angels, but they, are, they had um, over $22 million raised in non-dilutive funding, uh, including from J&J &J Labs, uh, from the NIH. Um, and, 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 and those were all very good signs for us that um, you know, at least they would have some working capital um, needed to develop their data until the, uh, the next round. But when syndicated, the amount raised you know, could even be oversubscribed. Um, and as for the remainder of the other types of startups beyond med tech and life sciences uh, that pitch angels in New York, uh, most common were those that were SaaS and IT companies. Uh, and we, 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 in those particular comp with those particular companies, we do expect to see um, those companies earning revenue. And we do, do expect to see some evidence of product market fit, which simply means the product shows some strong consumer market demand. Uh, next slide, please. Hey, Carlton, I just want to make sure we keep everybody on track here. We have about uh, five or six minutes left. Okay. okay. So, uh, uh, and please. I just want to be mindful that Amy, I want to make sure Amy gets a shot here too to, to, to okay. chime in. Okay. okay. So, Thank you. so what are angels looking for? And, and this, this is a loaded uh, slide right here. You know, obviously we're looking for high quality investment opportunities. Um, and these are the, I don't have to read it. These are the kind of uh, 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 businesses that we're looking for in, you know, in startups. And when actually, you know, with COVID though, the COVID really has uh, affected the way that we're looking at, at companies. Not only we're we looking for uh, those that are trying to heal the sick to find cures for COVID and other diseases. We're also looking for tech companies that ease remote work, increase mobility, develop new ways to transact business, banking, learning, and playing, um, and innovating and problem solving that go well beyond the, the pandemic. Okay, next slide. Uh, uh, before we do that, um, we're also looking at uh, companies that, uh, as I said, have a five to 12 X uh, return on your investment. And, and the med tech and life sciences field because of the higher risk and longer lead times, it's more like the 12X that we're look, expecting and hoping for. 
Okay, next slide. Okay, so I'd like to conclude my presentation uh, with uh, these that uh, relate to what angel investors are looking for. Company strategy, does a product or service being offered address a significant problem? What are the competitive advantages with their price, their IP portfolio? Um, addressable market, uh, we, you know, we look for uh, whether it's a domestic or international market they're approaching, who are the competitors, what's the market size and the growth rate. Um, competitive edge is the uh, usually the number of patents uh, that they have or protectable IP. Um, technology, we're looking for, you know, time to the first commercial shipment, when are they going to be developing their first prototypes, what's the level of technology risk. Next slide. Uh, financials for the capital structure, we're looking at, and this is part of the term sheet, uh, but we're also looking to see whether the management uh, team members have invested, do they have skin in the game? You know, what was the date and the price of the last round? Um, are the previous investors coming into the round? Um, um, the uh, company financial status, we're looking for the, um, you know, what's the current burn rate and how much uh, uh, money's in the bank and what's their uh, next cash call. Um, and, then, and then the proposed deal is the term sheet. The company, um, we talked about uh, what we're looking for in the company. Do they have a complete team? What's their overall experience? What, what's their specific uh, experience? Um, and, uh, you know, does the uh, company, uh, uh, effectively uh, communicate its message um, for, for its strengths. The, um, um, I, I guess the last, let me just go down to the last question, liquidity event, when and how. Uh, this might be the last question in my presentation, but it's really the first question that every angel uh, asks, how do I get my money back? Okay, uh, the next slide is uh, our, uh, some resources that I, I have uh, listed. Uh, you can Google these names for more information about angels and angel groups. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Carlton, I appreciate that. Amy. Thanks, Chris. Uh, as Chris mentioned, my name is Amy Lynn Meyerson. I am the president of the Connecticut Bar Association. I just want to let you know there's a wealth of resources available to you on the Connecticut Bar Association's webpage. So I'll pop that right up now. The uh, website is ctbar.org, and there's specifically free legal services for small businesses and uh, nascent startups. Um, if you go to the For the Public link, you'll see uh, the different uh, categories available for the public, but specifically when COVID hit, we did set up a um, <clears throat> small business legal clinic. And that is available for any small businesses with 25 or fewer employees. And you can get on a call with a lawyer who will speak to you, to you for 45 minutes and discuss anything uh, that you have to um, address dealing with your business, whether it is funding at the state and federal level or uh, issues with uh, bringing your employees back to work safely um, and other types of accommodations that might need to be made. Um, that is something that the Connect Bar Association is hosting in conjunction with the lead coordinating law firm, Robinson and Cole and other law, law firms throughout Connecticut and corporations as well. You'll also find on the Connecticut Bar Association's web page an entire page of, of small business resources that are, are available, um, whether uh, for federal, state, and other um, organizations, and you can scroll through that. And then finally, I want to mention uh, an opportunity that's available uh, to clients. It's called limited scope representation. And here in Connecticut, you can engage an attorney just for a discrete purpose um, without engaging them for all of your matters. And that way you can um, get legal representation uh, more economically and you know where the end date is. Um, so I just basically want to work through that quickly. Um, obviously, there's, there's a lot more that you can find on your own there, but I want to leave a couple of minutes, if we have, for people to ask any additional questions. Thanks, Chris. Thank you very much, Amy. So I don't have any other folk, any other questions in the chat. Uh, I want to uh, thank you folks for very much for spending your time with us today. Um, I got a bunch of notes I took down, so I'm. This is the beauty of being able to sort of moderate these learning while learn, learning while doing. Carlton, thank you much for your uh, presentation. Ken, thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, Amy, as, as always, uh, very, uh, very you know awesome stuff going forward here.